Chairperson Costa, fellow consumers. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I should perhaps point out that Luigi's advocacy over 11 years hasn't entirely been in vain. I did sit next to him at a dinner party for a former research assistant of mine a couple of years ago, and somewhere between the main course and the dessert, he converted me. <laughs> but unlike Luigi, who's an advocate in many forums, I'm genetically programmed to be a boring lawyer. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the law on the patenting of the human gene, and I'm going to refer to some recent cases. So for the non-lawyers amongst you, I'm sorry if I sound a little boring, but uh, as I said, I'm programmed to be a lawyer. First, the good news. The genes that exist in your body in their present cellular composition, and most cells contain genes, are not patentable. So whilst you've got hold of them in your body, then the various companies that seek to patent them really would admit that they are products of nature and they fall within one of the three judicially accepted exceptions to patentability, and I've summarised them there. Anything that could be considered to be a law of nature, a physical phenomenon, or an abstract idea is not patentable. That's taken from the United States context, but similar principles apply here. Also, under our federal patent statute, we have an exception in relation to biological processes for the generation of human beings. That came in at a time of concern about in vitro fertilisation and various other new technologies. So, within the limits of those exceptions, virtually anything else is arguably patentable. How do, let me start with a simple question. How do science, scientists examine your genes? Well, Unfortunately, there's no magic microscope that would enable someone to look at your genes whilst they're in your body. So what is necessary in order to examine someone's genetic features is to take a sample from the body, tissue, blood, whatever, and to isolate the gene of particular interest in the laboratory. And Luigi's already touched on this notion of isolation. The purpose of doing that is to obtain information about the isolated gene and in the particular case that I'm going to talk about, it's to determine whether or not women have a mutation associated with the BRCA1 or the BRCA2 gene, because it's known that mutations or genetic anomalies with those two genes are associated with a very high risk of breast and ovarian cancer. So obviously it's not of just pure scientific or academic interest, it has clinical significance. If you know you have this particular genetic anomaly, then although there's no form of treatment for it per se, you could take some preventive action or you could monitor your health much more intensively than you might otherwise do. So medical genetic testing involves looking at an isolated gene taken from you, determining whether or not there are abnormalities, and then making a clinical assessment as to whether or not you are likely to fall into a known range of risk associated with the particular anomaly. So far, so good. What is isolation? Well, I'll give you the definition of isolation from the BRCA1 patent in Australia. An, isol an isolated substance is one which is isolated or substantially pure nucleic acid, um, which is substantially separated from other cellular components which naturally accompany a native human sequence or a protein. Now without going into too much detail, it really means if you wanted to look at the yolk of an egg, you would have to break the egg and take the yolk out and examine it. So clearly isolating a gene does in fact separate the genetic information that you're interested in from other cellular material. And you might say, well, so what? In fact, it makes no difference in terms of the genetic testing because it's assumed for the purpose of testing that the isolated information that you're looking at is identical to the information in the gene in the body. Otherwise, what would be the purpose of testing? However, isolation has assumed a, an enormous legal significance because, as this quote from the United States recent case has indicated, in its simple form, the question in this case is whether an individual can obtain patent rights to a human gene. From a common sense point of view, most observers would answer, of course not. Patents are for inventions. A human gene is not an invention. And this is with reference to the United States case. 
The essence of Myriad's argument in this case is to say that it has not patented a human gene, but something quite different, an isolated human gene, which differs from a native gene because the process of extracting its results changes, it in its, uh, changes its molecular structure, although not its genetic code. So importantly, there's no change in the genetic code, but like in taking a yolk out of an egg, you change what it is you're looking at. You're no longer looking at the white, you're only looking at the yellow. We are therefore required to decide whether the process of isolating genetic material from a human DNA molecule makes the isolated genetic material a patentable invention. So that was the question that the US court formulated, and that's the question that still looms large in virtually every other jurisdiction in the world. In the United States litigation, which Luigi's referred to, the plaintiffs included four national organisations of doctors, geneticists, researchers, clinicians and other health professionals with a combined total of over 150,000 members as well as six of the nation's leading geneticists, two genetic counsellors, two women's health and breast cancer organisations and six patients who had been diagnosed with or were at risk of hereditary breast or ovarian cancer. So the United States litigation, like the case that Peter's been involved in, was also instituted by the Public Patent Foundation at the, George, at the Cardozo School of Law, with the assistance of the American Civil Liberties Union, and they're conducting the case as we speak. So the case went, uh, first of all, it was determined by the United States judge on what's called a summary judgment application. But each side filed its evidence and the judge gave judgment for one of the parties. And the judge found in favour of the plaintiffs. In the view of Federal District Court Judge Sweet, the challenge claims in this case, which is also to do with the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, did not satisfy the statutory requirement of patentability under Section 101 of the United States Patents Act, which is similar to our legislation, and were thus invalid. The preservation of the defining characteristic of DNA, the nucleotide sequence, in its native and isolated forms led the court to conclude that the challenged composition claims are directed to unpatentable products of nature. So that falls within the exception that I referred to earlier. So the plaintiff succeeded at least at first instance. Was that the end of the matter? Well, no. But interestingly, in the course of the judgment, the judge made the following comment. Many, including scientists in the field of molecular biology and genomics, have considered this practice a lawyer's trick that circumvents the prohibitions on the direct patenting of DNA in our bodies, but which in practice reaches the same result, referring to that particular article. So we have what is clearly non-patentable, naturally occurring gene, and what has become patentable, the gene in its isolated form, even though in terms of the characteristics that we're interested in, the genetic information, there isn't any difference between the two. Sorry, what was the lawyer's trick? Judge Arguing that the isolation Judge converted the non-patentable gene into a patentable oh, right, okay. event. The case was then taken to the United States Court of Appeal. 30 uh, amicus briefs were filed by 67 organisations, corporations, etc. What did the Court of Appeal do? It was divided, 2-1, and the appeal was upheld. So two of the three judges decided that the first judge got it wrong, and therefore they overturned the decision. Thus, so far, we've had this issue looked at by four federal district court judges in the United States, and they're divided 2-2. The majority, that is two of the three, held that the genetic material in question was patentable subject matter because they characterised the DNA as a chemical. In other words, they disregarded its function, they disregarded the genetic information, they looked at it as a chemical and found that because the process of isolation meant that the isolated gene involved a composition where the covalent bonds had been severed, for those of you who have studied chemistry, that that therefore uh, made it into a patentable chemical, whereas in its naturally occurring state it wasn't patentable. And in the case of Judge Moore, uh, she was of the view that the increased utility of this isolated gene rendered it patentable, in particular because the US Patent Office for 30 years has been patenting isolated genes. And I think at last count something like 24% of the human genome has been patented. Maybe more. 
So we're not just talking about one particular gene, BRCA1 or 2, we're talking about a very substantial proportion of the entire human genome, which is now the subject of patents. That's just in the United States. And here. And here. The BRCA1 gene, which is patented in the United States, which is the subject of this case, is patented in Australia as well. Ju Judge Lurie took the view that the isolated DNA is structurally different from DNA in the body on the sole basis that in the process of being removed from the body and its surrounding chemicals and tissues, a covalent electric bond was broken. The analogy I would use is taking a yolk out of an egg severs the link between the yolk and the white. There's no question about that. But is the isolated yolk different from the yolk in the egg? I don't think so. But with all due respect, according to this judge, that was the critical distinguishing feature. The court also concluded that isolation had created a chemically different and therefore markedly different, which was the legal test that had to be satisfied, chemical from native, compared with native DNA as a result of human intervention and the new chemical was therefore held to be patentable subject matter. Is that the end of the matter in the United States? No. We're now before the United States Supreme Court this Friday on an application for leave to appeal. Although one interesting thing happened in the course of the United States ca case. When the case was first started, the United States Patent Office was joined as a defendant and the United States government sided with the defendant corporation in claiming that this particular isolated gene and all isolated genes were patentable. Interestingly, in the course of the case, by the time it got to appeal, the United States government has now changed its position. The United States government filed an amicus brief with the uh, Court of Appeals and uh, in that brief argued that uh, isolated genes per se were not patentable under US law. So that's quite an interesting development. Can I ask what amicus means? Friend, friend of the court. You come along as a non-party and say, I've got something to say and you file a brief and the court looks at your arguments. Okay, so what's the position in Australia? Well, uh, Luigi's referred to the case uh, that commences in the Federal Court in Sydney at 10 a.m. next Monday. That's a case brought by two plaintiffs, uh, Cancer Voices Australia and a woman from Queensland who had a history of uh, problems against uh, the American uh, patentee, Myriad Genetics, the same company that's been uh, sued in the United States, and the licensee in Australia. In other words, the company that has the exclusive rights to the patent in Australia. In the Australian case, unlike the United States, the challenge has been limited to three claims in one patent in order to keep it simple and in brackets reduce costs and in brackets reduce delay. The patent, as in the United States, relates to mutations on the BRCA1 gene which are known to be associated with an increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer. Now the significance of the patent is this. If in the United States, for example, you want to know whether or not you have that mutation, you have to have your test done by the company and you have to pay the company to do the test. Anyone else who does the test without a license or approval of the company is in breach of the patent or infringes the patent and can be sued by the company. So it has exclusive rights to determine whether or not you have this particular mutation and therefore, to all intents and purposes, you have to pay it to find out the answer to that information. So as I've indicated, the hearing starts on Monday. <coughs> the legal basis for the challenge in uh, federal court in Sydney. Um, the legal basis for the challenge is similar to the basis for the challenge in the United States. The plaintiffs contend that this is not an invention or a manner of manufacture, which is the buzzword used in the Australian patent legislation, and therefore doesn't satisfy the threshold statutory requirements of patentability. The plaintiffs argue that it's merely a scientific discovery of a naturally occurring biological fact. Myriad didn't genetically engineer or change anything. All they discovered was a naturally occurring mutation, which they knew, and other people know, and everyone knows, is associated with a higher risk of cancer. So their discovery of that led to their application for a patent, and they are now given exclusive rights in the countries in which they're the patentee to um, investigate or test whether or not you have this particular genetic anomaly. Uh, 
The other alternative argument which we have available in Australia, which doesn't arise under United States patent law, arises out of Section 18, Subsection 2 of the Patent Act, which I referred to earlier, which prevents the patenting of anything that relates to bio biological processes for the generation of human beings. So one of the arguments is, this is genetic information. The only purpose of genetic information is to transmit genetic characteristics from one person to offspring. And therefore, on one view, it falls within that particular exemption under the Australian legislation. There's been a lot of debate, uh, and I'm sure Luigi and others would have views about whether or not patenting is a good thing, a bad thing, or an indifferent thing. Um, we say that under Australian law, those policy or public interest or economic or commercial considerations are simply not relevant to the legal question. It either satisfies, you might not like that conclusion, but it cuts both ways, of course, because once we get into an argument in court about whether patents are desirable socially, economically and whatever, then we open up a Pandora's box and courts aren't very well qualified to make judgments about those sorts of matters. Courts are very good at interpreting words, applying statutes and determining whether or not the statutory test is satisfied. So there's a lot of debate, and Luigi's uh, well on top of it, as to whether or not patenting is desirable. This case isn't about whether patenting is desirable or not. It's simply about whether it's legally permissible to patent a genetically isolated or an isolated gene. The plaintiffs say yes. Surprise, surprise, the defendants say no. So as I've indicated, uh, for the purpose of the legal argument, broader questions of public interest or social cost and public benefit appear to be irrelevant. I say appear because there is a proviso to the statutory provision which excludes from patentability something where it's considered to be generally inconvenient to grant a patent. And there may be argument in the case as to whether or not that exclusion may be applicable, and if so, whether that might open uh, up some of these considerations. But on present indications, I think the the better view is that these broader considerations are not relevant. That's all I have to say. Um, I leave you with that cartoon, and uh, along with the others, I'd be only too pleased to answer some questions later, and I can see one there already. Has what been used? It, it, the whole debate about generally inconvenient arose in the context of medical treatments that were patented. And there was a view for a time, particularly in New Zealand and to some extent in Australia, that medical treatment was probably not something that could be patentable because it was not generally convenient to do so. Most courts have now abandoned that approach and I don't think it's generally applicable as an exemption in relation to medical treatment per se. Thank you.